Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, let the collective meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be well-pleasing in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. What is treasure worth? I got into this a little bit with the kids and the children's message today. But we can think of examples in our lives or in history that demonstrate what people think treasure is worth. If you think of the gold rush in the early days of the United States of America, when the frontier was expanding out west, when the gold rush happened, people gave up everything. They left their lives behind, and they risked pretty much everything, including their life, to strike it rich. Why? Because they thought if they did that, if they found that treasure, then all of their problems would be solved. That gold would take care of all of their needs. Or maybe you've heard of stories of people that come along and say, I know when Jesus is going to return, and I know where He's going to return, so you should sell all your stuff and follow me to that place. And people do often very tragically because we believe the Bible says nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the Son, only the Father, and so the people that do that end up disappointed because they go to the place and the time and Jesus isn't there. Well, today in Matthew 13, we have two parables about the kingdom of heaven, and in those parables, they seem to be about, and you've likely heard it preached this way as well, that the disciples of Jesus are giving up everything to get the kingdom of heaven, otherwise known as the cost of discipleship, that the kingdom of heaven is such a treasure that you would give up everything in order to obtain it. But this is not the way these parables are meant to be understood. Let's reread them once again and pay particular attention to the language and the setting of these parables. Jesus said, "'The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it.'" Now, the traditional reading of these passages says that we are the man who finds the treasure hidden in the field, that we are the merchant who finds the pearl of great value. And there are some compelling biblical reasons for this interpretation. We have Matthew 19 and the story of the rich man, and Jesus tells him that in order to inherit eternal life, what must he do? Sell all that he has and give it to the poor. But we understand that to be Jesus talking specifically to him, and that was the thing that was preventing him from following Jesus, was his worldly goods. And the truth that the kingdom of heaven is certainly worth selling everything that you have, even giving up your life in order to obtain it, that is true. And the Bible attests to that truth. And thirdly, there really is a cost for following Jesus. There is a cost for our discipleship. And many of you don't need me to tell you that. You've experienced it firsthand in small ways and in large. But this is the unlikely interpretation of these parables for a couple of reasons. First off, it's not talking about somebody who is already a disciple at the beginning of the parable. It's talking about someone who does not yet have the kingdom of heaven. They either find it by accident or they're searching intentionally for it. And the truth is, we don't find the kingdom of heaven. We don't choose Jesus. Our Old Testament reading reminds us how the relationship between God and His people began. He chose them. He chose them to be His treasured possession, not the other way around. 
And the last reason why this can't really be our interpretation of these parables is we don't do what the man and the merchant do. We don't give up everything for the kingdom of heaven, especially before we're even a disciple of Jesus. Before we become a disciple of Jesus, we don't even know what the problem is, much less looking for a solution. And so it can't be that we're the man and that we are the merchant. So if these parables aren't really about the cost of discipleship, what are they about? Well, they're about encouraging and assuring the disciples of what's going to be happening to them as Jesus describes in the third parable, which we'll get to in a moment. Answering the question, am I good enough? You see, in the the book of Matthew, when there's a lone human figure acting in a parable, and it's about establishing the reign of God, that lone character is always Jesus. That lone character always represents Jesus. You see, Christ is the merchant searching for the pearl of great value. Christ is the man who finds the treasure hidden in the field of our world. Christ is the one who gave up everything in order to find that treasure and make it His own. So what is this treasure? Well, to answer that question, we just simply have to think, what did Jesus give up everything for? You. You, the people of God, His cherished and beloved children, or speaking collectively, His church. He placed His name on you and called you His own. He went to death on a cross, shedding His blood to wipe away all of your sins, giving up everything, His divine power and majesty, even His earthly life, so that you may live and be His treasured possession. Now, if you're still doubting this interpretation, think about your own life. Did Jesus find you or did you find Him? The truth is that Jesus sought you out and found you. Now, if you're like me, you grew up in the church, and if you grew up in the church, you were baptized, likely as a baby. And you maybe can't even remember the event of your baptism, but I can assure you nobody asked your permission They didn't say to the baby, do you want to be baptized? When they ask that question, who answers on the baby's behalf? Their parents, because God has given them the authority to speak on matters of faith for their children. And then continuing on from there, your parents and your church, either through other members or the pastor, taught you all about Jesus and how He's gathering you to Himself and giving you His gifts. But even if you didn't grow up in the church, as some of you may not have. Or maybe you were baptized as an adult instead of an infant, and they did ask you that question. If you're honest, the story always begins with some action from God first. Now, I recalled hearing a story. I was listening to a Christian radio station, and one of the people was talking about this really cool experience they had. They were speaking at a Christian conference, and they noticed a man who was sort of hanging out in the back of the room. And it turns out the man was a Muslim, and he had encountered somebody on the plane on his way to where he was going who told him about this conference and a little bit about Jesus, and he was curious. And so he came to hear more about this Jesus. And the way the story was portrayed was that they were saying, this is the reason why we need to tell other people, because we bring people to Jesus. This guy chose to follow Jesus. But we disagree because all of those things were providential. The fact that he was on the same plane as this man and that they had the conversation they had are all beyond the control of the individual who ends up going to a conference to learn more about Jesus. Who do you think is behind all of those things? That often when you hear a story about somebody choosing to follow Jesus, somewhere along the line, somebody came in their life that they didn't know, they had no control over the circumstances, that begins that whole journey, and who else could that be other than the Holy Spirit of our God working through His church? 
giving the Jesus stuff out into the world so that people may come to know this truth that He assures us of today, that you're not left on your own to find your own way, that He is searching for you. And that when He finds you, in joy He gives up everything He has in order to obtain you. So whether or not you came to faith later in life, or whether you were born into a church-going family and were brought to baptism before you can remember, Christ has been searching you out, has been seeking to obtain you, has been calling you to Himself, and when He has found you, He has made you His own, a treasured possession, one that He considers worth more than all that He has, because He has given up all of that for you. Another reason that we can trust these parables are told to encourage the disciples of Jesus by describing Christ's action on our behalf rather than our own is that even after we become disciples, we don't really behave this way. Even after we have all the reason in the world to seek Jesus because He's found us and He's redeemed us and has given us a brand new life, an eternal life of perfect righteousness, simply in faith as a gift of His grace, we still don't really give up everything to follow Him. Often we don't want to give much of anything up to be disciples of Jesus. We'd like to just fit in and go along with the rest of the group. But the man and the merchant in in these parables, the man in particular, not only does he give up everything he has, but he does it joyfully. I don't know about you, but that doesn't really describe me very often. Now that even now, I have all the reasons to do that, and I still don't. That's why this is an assurance, because it's resting on a sure thing rather than a sporadic thing. It's resting on the action of Jesus the one who fulfilled the law perfectly and who has given you that perfect righteousness as a gift of His grace. Well, now we get to the final parable of chapter 13 in Matthew, the net and the sorting of the bad fish from the good. Now, Jesus has already, in the parable of the sower, talked about in the parable of the weeds what's going to happen on the final day that the angels are going to come and sort the good from the bad. And if this is meant to encourage the disciples, it's hard to see it. Because what's the natural thing that pops into your head when we read about the coming of God on the final day and the sorting of good and bad? The question always is, well, am I going to be a good fish or a bad one? And how do I know I'm going to be a good fish or a bad one? Well, and you're, you're in good company asking that question of yourself. This was the question that drove Martin Luther almost insane about his faith. Am I good enough? And if I need to become good enough, how exactly do I do that? And many of you may know some of the stories of the lengths to which he went in order to accomplish being good, in order to be worthy of God's love, in order to be seen as an object of His affection. And yet, the cruel reality that he always ended up realizing is that he fell short. For every step forward, there were numerous steps back. And there's good reason for him to think so, because the Bible says in Romans 3, verse 23, indeed, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is an inevitable truth about fallen humanity that we do not do the things that the new Spirit of God in us desires to do. Is this a question that plagues you? Am I good enough? Do you think about the day that the Lord returns and wonders which side you'll be on? Will you be sorted as a good fish or a bad? Or as wheat or weeds? Or whatever the image is. Your friends in Christ today is meant to be an encouragement from Jesus to His disciples. So His desire is not to put this question in your mind, but rather to inform you what makes you good. 
Is it you and the choices that you have made? Perhaps the choice to give up everything and follow Jesus? Is that what makes you good? Just look at the twelve disciples. They answered the call of follow me often in a way that many of us can't imagine. One moment sitting at the boats mending the nets with your dad and some random guy walks up and says, follow me, and they get up and go. Who does that? Well, they did. And yet still the stories in the Scriptures are rife with their failure to understand this truth, that it isn't about their, their deeds and their goodness, but rather about the deeds of Christ and His. It is Jesus who makes you good. It is Jesus who finds you and makes you His own. It is Jesus who redeems you and washes you clean of all your sins. It's Jesus. It's not you. Therefore, you can trust the promise that you are indeed good, for Jesus is perfect and faithful in all the ways that we are not. And if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Your unclean and sinful state has been washed away by His blood, the blood of the Lamb, because to Jesus, you are the treasure. Now, this is a new treasure that is revealed in Jesus, that the people of God are sought after by Him to such a degree that He's willing to give up everything in order to obtain you. That the kingdom of heaven isn't a place that you choose to be or that you earn your way into or that you purchase, but rather one that is given as a free gift of faith for those who have been won and purchased by our Lord Jesus Christ, by the one who made a sacrifice that we couldn't make. See, we couldn't give up everything for the treasure, but Jesus could and He did, and the treasure is obtained and that treasure is you. Our Lord Jesus joyfully gave up everything for you, calls you His own, makes you His own, and has given you the kingdom of heaven. So thanks be to God for Jesus Christ our Lord. In His name. Amen.